thanks to them for doing this because this gives you a chance to maybe bring kids out, let them see what life was like here maybe 100, maybe 200 years ago. So come check it out. Great event going on. It's going on into the afternoon. Starts at 11 a.m. Uh, free admission. Won't cost you a thing to come out here. There'll be all kinds of demonstrations going on, all kinds of exhibits to see, some storytelling, some music. They've got tents set up. Wear your rain jacket. Be prepared for the weather conditions, but it's really a very comfortable day. Not getting any rain right now here uh, just off Gary Wade Boulevard on High Street at the King Family Library. And again, the event starts at 11 a.m. Appalachia, a backward glance. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's always a pleasure to be part of events that remembers our past. Uh, Thomas Wolfe said in his debut novel, The Comrade Angel, the years flow like water. And that is so true, they move on so quickly. When you're young, they flow like a slow delta stream, but when you get my age, it's more like a rushing mountain stream. They flow faster and faster. And what we fail to realize as, as the years pass, if we don't take note of things, it's forgotten someday. And it's so important to remember the past, and it's, it's our challenge to do that with the crafts, all these wonderful craftsmen here. If someone had passed that knowledge along to another generation, they would already been lost. And regretfully, some things have been. And it's the same way with storytelling. We can't all make a beautiful basket, but we can all tell stories. And it's important to do that. You don't have to tell stories about famous people. You need to tell about your own grandparents and your great grandparents and the legacy they left behind because they may be the ones that don't get written down. And if you tell it long enough, someone like me is going to come along and write it down. So it's important to do that, to preserve it for future generations. Uh, for instance, there, there was a poem that's been recited lots of times at funerals, What's Between the Dash? So many times people will get out their Bible and write a birth date, and the next notation to send there about this person is the dash, and then the day they died. And there's nothing to indicate what happened during that dash. And some of those dashes are 90 years long or longer. And you need to tell those stories, and you need to tell your children the stories. And if you don't do that, uh, future generations are not going to know these things. Uh, I'll give you a good instance. Um, in my lifetime, when I was a little boy, there was an old doctor that lived in Sevierville by the name of Dr. Roberts. And he, he was, by the time I was 10 years old, he was in his 90s. And he used to tell me stories about when they built the courthouse. Now, here I am at my age telling a story that's only secondhand knowledge that happened about 125 years ago. So it's important to, to listen to the older generations, to hear what they have to say. They don't have to speak perfect English. They don't have to have a Harvard degree. Just listen to what they say and record it the way they say it because part of the stories, too, are the way they talked in the past. We have a very rich culture here, and I heard a lady speak last night that said she went to Scotland, and there were so many people on the tour with her that couldn't understand their brogue, but she said, I'm from Appalachia, I understood it perfectly. So it's been, this is one of the few pockets where that's been saved. So it's important to say some of the things that we might have been a little bit embarrassed about in the past as well. Everything we say may be important someday, and I can't express that enough, and I appreciate the library and all the staff here and what they've done to make this day possible. And thank you for your attention, and have a wonderful day. We were displaying the John Severe King Family Bible. This originally belonged to John Sevier family. He gave it to his younger daughter, Nancy, who married Walter King. And since then, it was in the King's family. And oral tradition states that the youngest male of each generation was to inherit this Bible in order to keep it in the family. In 1960s, Walter, uh, actually John Sevier King III joined the Sons of the Revolution and in 1989, he dedicated this uh, Bible to the society. He lived in Ohio, and I would suspect that he 
wanted to keep this Bible in Tennessee, and we've had it ever since. And it's been in storage for the past years, and this is the first year we've brought it out for display. I'm General John Severe. I uh, also served as Tennessee's first governor. I was one of the heroes of the Battle of Kings Mountain, where we destroyed one-fourth of the army under Cornwallis and changed the direction in the course of the Revolutionary War in the South. I served six intermittent terms as Tennessee's governor, and I also served both in the uh, Senate uh, the state senate and the uh, state legislature in North Carolina and Tennessee as well as the federal legislatures both in uh, Philadelphia and later in Washington and I was victorious in all 35 major battles that I fought led troops in during the war and no other uh, Revolutionary War commander was victorious in every major battle in which they commanded troops. And what's your real name, sir? My name's Bob Jones. How did you get into portraying John Severe? Um, I was doing some living history portrayal primarily because I felt like in speaking with people that too many people didn't know enough about our Constitution and about their constitutionally guaranteed rights and the history and the reason that we have those rights and so I began programming for that reason and then later on I was asked to portray John Severe and apparently they were happy with my portrayal because I've been doing it since then. So is that a muzzle loading, loading gun? Yes. Cap and ball? Was no, what? it's flintlock. Cap and ball had not, was, wasn't invented until about 1805. Uh-huh. So this preceded? Absolutely. Okay, and this is a flint. This was uh, the height of modern technology during the Revolutionary War. Before this, uh, they had rifles, but you had to light a wick and lower it down into a pan of powder to set the charge off in the barrel. And if the wick went out or if it burned up, then you were out of luck. Uh, they did develop another system called a wheel lock. Mm -hmm. And you wound it up, placed a flint against it, and when you pulled the trigger, it would release the spring and it would spin and make sparks. But they were, uh, you had to have a watchmaker who would make the tiny little springs and so forth. And do you know what kind of prices highly skilled uh, craftsmen make today? A lot. A lot. Yeah. And it was a lot back then. <laughs> so they were very, very expensive. Uh -huh. So there wasn't enough. They were, they were too expensive and, and too complicated to be affordable for an entire army. If you were a king or some nobility or, or you, your family was very wealthy, you could afford one. Otherwise, not so much. And then the flintlock came out, and it was a much simpler mechanism and much uh, less expensive to reproduce, and so then they could equip armies. And so this is the height of modern technology in 1776. And the flint activated its own spark. It does. Uh-huh. Can you see that? I can. Yes. See the spark? And that ignited it. That ignited the powder in the pan. Uh -huh. And then there's a tiny little hole you can see right here. Uh, I'll let you see it. Don't know if you can get the camera on it or not, but there's a tiny little hole there called a vent, and the powder burns in the pan through that hole and sets the charge off in the barrel. And then the, uh, is there a ball that is inserted, inserted at the so other? You, uh, well, where is the ball? The first thing you do is load it with powder. Powder. And then you take a patch, because you see the rifling in the barrel? Yeah. So that makes the ball fit very tightly inside the barrel. And that way when the powder is ignited in the chamber, it expands and pushes the ball, and the powder causes the ball to spin. Mm -hmm. Because the balls are usually made out of cast lead. And so they get uh, pockets of air in them. So if they don't spin, they don't fly oftentimes in a straight direction. Mm -hmm. But if you spin them, then that uh, 
abnormality will rotate around a central axis and they'll fly straight. And so the smoothbore muskets are accurate out to about 50 yards, but the rifles are accurate out to about 300. So the ball is here and yet that gas causes it to spin way up there. And to well, you, you take the ramrod and you push the ball Oh, you push the ball the down, man. Gotcha. So it's seated firmly against I the power. I see. Well, who's giving us this good information? What's your name? John Severe. Oh, you're John Severe. <laughs> sure you are. <laughs> Thank you. Booger Man, it was, it was named Booger Town sometime before the Civil War. And my dad's family moved in there uh, before the Civil War, too. And so we decided to take that name to honor old people and old ways of life and old music which they grew up singing and playing. So that's what that's what we are. I'm a Watson of Boogertown. This is a barber of Knoxville and we're married to each other. Spotted <laughs> pony. Two, four. It's a typical uh, weave. Uh, you start and you go with, you can choose your diameter. And you can go halfway, quarter way, or three quarters, and it changes your pattern. It's it's really a, a, yeah. a fun thing. I bet I bet when you're doing one, you get kind of lost in it. Well, I have this. I've done one this size one time. Instead of making it wide, I went about this way. Right. And it took me 22 hours to stitch it because of the now do you work under magnification or do you just no well I, I hadn't done any like that in a while <laughs> it's been about how many hours or something like that um uh, i'd say probably three or four okay it, not really that much time on one like do you that. know in your head what it's going to look like no. or does it just become what it's going to it become just, each, every piece i make is individually sure is. I don't duplicate, I don't copy, and every piece of makes is unique. I never make more than one at a time. This outfit would have been from the 1770s or 1780s. And my husband died two weeks ago. And they only give a widow five days to rectify her husband's debts. I didn't have enough money to pay the rest of the land. So I lost my home. I lost everything. I had to go live at the poor farm. And you know what we do at the poor farm? We have to stay busy. So there's a lady that goes through the community and she gathers rags. She's called the rag lady. And she brings them back to the poor farm. And we have to stay busy there. So we have to take the rags apart. So I pull these, pull these things apart like this. That's what I do all day long. Separate these rags. And then they take these rags and they mix them with clay. And they put them in between the logs of the log cabin to chink it. To keep out the cold. Or they can take it to the, uh, to the, to sell them for paper. Was back in the 1700s, they made paper out of rice. I was about 12 or 13, and I spent the summer with my granddaddy. Right, right. It would have been in the early 40s, and I can remember him taking been over to a truckload of rosiniers to the poor farm. Rosiniers? Ooh, I love those things. And it was hickory cane corn, so you have to take it the day it comes in. they got to get it up or they've lost it. Yeah. And I said, Granddaddy, why are you taking that up there? And he said, I had family that we could that they couldn't take care of that was in the poor farm, and I'm, give, I'm paying back. Oh. And he picked their grave. Had a cattle bed on the truck, and they picked that cattle bed full of rosiniers to take it. <laughs> My name is
name's Renee Thrapp, and my mom and dad were born in and lived in uh, Black Mountain, North Carolina. And one of my favorite things that they did was clogging. And they said that, uh, they, you know, Black Mountain was a very small town, lot, not much entertainment. So what they would do is on Saturday night, they would clear everything out and block the intersection. And not very big intersection, but big for them. And they would uh, have clog dancing on Saturday. So uh, they ended up moving to California, and my father was a square dance caller, but they did some exhibition uh, dancing, and they did the clogging. And it was a hit, and everybody wanted to know if my dad would teach it, and he didn't have time, so he said that my mom said she'd do it. So she started teaching clogging in Southern California, and she's the one that, that did the clogging on the West Coast and got it popular. And it was about the time that um, Urban Cowboy came out. So that was very popular, so the clogging became very popular. But uh, from the time I was little, my folks would, uh, would clog. So that's, and I learned, and my brother and sister learned, and uh, I miss it. It's a, a wonderful art form, and it's, it's a dance that came in, in the, uh, that region because it was a mixture of the, uh, the black dancing and, and the Irish jig, and they made it truly their own dance style, so it has its origins in Appalachian. Um, one other thing that I can remember is uh, my dad came from a big family, and uh, he had aunts and uncles, there was about 13 of them. Whenever they'd all get together, they would all play the instruments, so they would all play instruments, and they'd all sing, and they would sing the southern, different southern songs, and then they would clog. Oh, my name is Becky Weaver, uh -huh. and I am a basket weaver. You were born into it, huh? Uh, well, married, <laughs> married into, into it. it. Yeah. So how long have you been doing this? Um, for 17 years. So I'm relatively new. <laughs> So did you get into it through through the marriage, or did you? Uh, how did you come in? Come into I I just I saw in the newspaper in the local newspaper that there was going to be a basket class, and thought that would be fun a fun thing to do, and, oh, okay. and it was. And then I took continued to take classes from the same lady, and uh, then just kind of branched out on my own. So I already had a basic knowledge of working with my hands and how to read patterns. And, and so that that helped a lot. Helped a lot. And so you, you have your own place in, in here in uh, in Super County. Um, well, we're actually we uh, are located. We live in Alcoa, which is our home studio, but we do uh, sell at the Cliff Dwellers Gallery in the Arts and Craft community. She got me into it a little bit. Uh, we go to shows like this. Or events. Now, the woodworking, some of the woodworking I've known for a long time. But, uh, as far as chairs, and stuff, I would do, um, I could sell the product, but I'm naturally a salesman. But I wouldn't have a lot to do. And she taught me a weave, and the rest of it I just picked up by reading, taking a couple of classes, and then kind of develop my own style. You have to center the holes, cut the dowels, glue it, then I put a light stain on it, and then get the seagrass that I use here and cut it and everything. I'd say about total probably four to five hours, four hours, four and a half.
These are going to be standing angels. How long have you been doing this? <laughs> I'll be 70 in November, 62 years. How'd you get into it? My aunt got me into play when I was eight years old. She started taking me to this little old lady ceramic shop, uh -huh. and I ended up getting a master's in mud pie, so <laughs> it stuck. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Thank you. So, Earl, what's the, what's the difference between a crow and a raven? Ravens are a lot bigger bird, and they're actually smarter. The ravens are smartest of all birds. Um, yeah, you can teach you can teach ravens to speak. You cannot teach a crow to speak. It, 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 it uh, can't wrap its head around the language, but you can teach a raven to say hello, uh, like a parent, sort of, uh -huh. you know. I'll be darned. Very, very smart. Uh, crows are very intelligent, too, don't get me wrong. But a raven, they live a lot higher elevations and stuff, a lot harder place to live. they got to be a smarter bird. Um, where I'm from, where my people are from, the snowbird area, you know, it's higher elevations. There's ravens that live back, but they aren't ravens that live down here in the flat. They don't live like in Sevierville here, piece of forest down here. Yeah, Isn't there something different about the tail feathers too? I don't know about the, tail feathers, or the size of them. A raven is a lot larger than a crow. They're closer to the size of a red tail hawk, almost. called Job's Tears, you grow them, and they're just hard as bees, and a needle go right through them to string them. It's a, you heard of the trail of tears? Yeah, yeah. Well, the Indians, when they was walking the trail of tears, picked these up off of the bush about knee high, and they made jewelry out of it, and they dyed it with berries, like blackberries and different berries, and they traded it then for what they needed with it. FCE group, we are the, the family uh, education group here in Sevierville. We meet once a month here at the library on Tuesdays, the fourth Tuesday at 1030. We'd like to have everyone come out and join our group.
<laughs> My name's David Dogle. I'm the owner of Vogel's Broom Shop. Uh, family's been doing the brooms in Gatlinburg for over 100 years now. And I've been doing it for 51 years. All of our handles are all different kinds of wood. We make, when we make all of them, we make 22 different styles of brooms. We got brooms made out of 100-year-old tobacco sticks. Uh, we carve a lot of uh, walking sticks and hiking sticks. What's that? Have you ever heard of fat lighter wood? <laughs> That's petrified pine, what that tree's carved out of. Yeah. Yeah, it's really highly flammable. It's pure pine rosin. Pretty wood. Uh, and we still do it all by hand. We don't use no power tools of any kind. It's all put together by hand. Uh, my grandfather and my dad made brooms, and I was raised up in it. Oh, that's, uh, that's one thing that we don't you don't see much of anymore is handmade stuff sent, sent down to the next generation. They're people letting it die off, and they're not trying to keep it going. We've got brooms probably all over the world because we've had people from France, England. I've got one I know of in the Holy Lands. These are not rocks. What are they? These are remains of the old iron forge and pigeon forge oh. that are right, was located right underneath the mill, right next to it. So when the water gets up underneath the mill, after it goes back down, we'll go down and we'll find bits and pieces of stuff left over from it. Well, I'll be. This is from the old mill and pigeon it is. forge. Sir, sure is. From how long ago do you think? Uh, the the uh, Iron Forge started about 1815, roughly. Uh -huh. It stopped somewhere right around 1850, so we figure this has been down there at least 150 years, probably. My gosh. Yeah. Now, what's the big piece? Same thing? Well, it's called a uh, gutter iron. They would have had these big gutters that the molten iron ore would flow through into a collection point where they would start to pound it out. Uh -huh. uh, this was left over. For some reason they either abandoned that one or it wasn't any good and they just left it there and it got buried up and eventually we found a piece of just a little piece sticking out and started playing with it. Next thing I know, wow. we got a pretty good find. That was so, a good find. It was a good find. Sure was. Are you wearing a flower sack? Oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> just getting stuff out of the rain. Uh, yes, I can. We tell stories to teach us to use our to imagination. The footsteps of the people that came before us. We share stories to tell important lessons to develop our youth and our children. We tell stories to show us our role models to emulate and the dark side to abandon. We tell stories as a way to transfer information, um, to understand attitudes, experiences, and points of views. So people have been celebrating their heritage for eons, passing it from one generation to the next. And we have this great opportunity to see how other people think and to reminisce, reminisce of times that have gone by. Um, a cherished way of life, handed down from one generation to the next. 